It is commonly stated that Tolkien made hobbits a reflection of himself, which could be evident whether intentional or not. On a blank leaf I scrawled, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. I did not and do not know why. The first edition of The Hobbit is known to have come out in 1937. While there are speculations that hobbits were inspired by other aspects, hobbits as their own were created by Tolkien. By October 15, 1937, it was revealed that The Hobbit was in the process of publication, while earlier that year on May 11th, Allen and Unwin had told Tolkien they had interested one of the outstanding firms in American publishers for the book and asked for his own illustrations. I have received one postcard alluding, I suppose, to the Times Review, containing just the words, Sig Hobbitor ad Astra, or thus it is hobbited to the stars. He also had the concept of hobbits all figured out, though the letter would reveal that by then he would have gotten a letter from his publisher Unwin, who had just sent a copy of The Hobbit to Richard Hughes. Unwin would warn Tolkien that a large public would be clamoring next year to hear more from you about hobbits, which we would find later in Lord of the Rings. They were supposed to be a branch of the human race, with the earliest of them showing up sometime in the Third Age. The earliest tales seemed to glimpse the time when they dwelt in the upper vales of Anduin, between the eaves of Greenwood the Great and the Misty Mountains. Why they later undertook the hard and perilous crossing of the mountains into Eriador is no longer certain. There are three types of hobbits, the Harfwits, Stores, and Fallowhides, each entering in that order. This had occurred before the crossing of the mountains into Eriador by the latter. The Harfwits were browner in skin, shorter and smaller, and they had more to do with the dwarves than the other two types. They started moving west early going into Weathertop. They were most normal and representative, as well as the most numerous and more inclined to settle into one place. The stores were broader and heavier in build and lingered long by the great river Anduin and were less shy of men. They came after the Harfoots and followed the course of the loud water southwards and would dwell there for a short period of time before moving northwards. Lastly, the Fallowhides, such as the Tooks and Masters of Buckland, came afterwards being the least numerous in the northerly branch. Thus it can be stated that most of the hobbits you see in Lord of the Rings fell into this category. They were more friendly with the elves and were more skillful in language and song than crafts and preferred hunting. They would cross the mountains north of Rivendell and go down the river Horwell to Eriador to mingle with the other kinds. They would find the men and elves west of Eriador between the misty mountains and the mountains of Loon with the remnant still there in the Dunedain. However, such earlier settlements were long forgotten by the time of the Hobbit or Bilbo's time. In 1601 of the Third Age, the Fallowhide brothers, Marcho and Blancho, went from Bree to Argyleb, the High King and Fornus, crossing the Brown River Baron Duin, with other hobbits following them passing the Bridge of Stonebows, taking all the land to dwell between the river and the Far Downs. They were asked to keep the Great Bridge in repair and acknowledge the Lordship of Argyleb II. Thus began the Shire Reckoning for the year at the crossing of the Brandywine as the hobbits turned the name became year one of the Shire and all later dates were reckoned from it. As a result, the years of the Third Age would be found by adding 1600 to the dates of Shire Reckoning. At once, the Western Hobbits fell in love with their new land and they remained there and soon passed once more out of the history of men and of elves. While there was still a king, they were in name his subjects, but they were, in fact, ruled by their own chieftains and meddled not at all with events in the world outside. The hobbits took the land for their own with the last battle of Furnace, with the witch king of Angmar choosing their own chiefs, a thane to hold the authority of the king that was gone. They prospered and multiplied for a thousand years after the dark plague in 37 Shire Reckoning until the disaster of the long winter and famine where thousands perished. But more of them came back in the days of Darth, or 1158 to 1160, and the land was rich and kindly, and though it had long been deserted when they entered it, it had before been well tilled, and there the king had once had many farms, cornlands, vineyards, and woods.